Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. So hello everyone and welcome to today's virtual program at the Commonwealth Club of California. My name is Bethany McLean. I'm a contributing editor at Vanity Fair and I'm so happy to be here moderating this program today. Would also like to thank the Ken and Jackie Broad Family Fund for their support of this program. I'm pleased to be joined by Wall Street Journal reporter Josh Mitchell to discuss his excellent new book, The Debt Trap, How Student Loans Became a National Catastrophe. Student loans are one of the most pressing issues young people face, but not just young people. According to Josh's book, half of borrowers are over age 35. This is also a huge issue for our country. Americans owe some $1.6 trillion in student loan debt. For perspective, that's about equal to the GDP of Canada. It's $700 billion more than the total US credit card debt. And about 500 billion of that amount is not going to be paid back, which actually eclipses the write-offs from the subprime mortgage crisis. This is at least in part a story of good intentions gone badly wrong and a system that was meant to offer opportunity turning into one of exploitation. We'll be discussing a lot in the next hour and I wanna ask your questions too. So if you're watching along with us, please put your questions in the text chat on YouTube and we'll be getting to them later in the program. Thank you so much, Josh, for joining us. So I have sure, to thanks. admit, I'm a little bit jealous of your book. I think this is such a critically important topic and I'm so glad you wrote it. And I wanted to start, you wrote a story back in April for the Wall Street Journal and you recount in your book this story as well. It's about Betsy DeVos calling Jamie Dimon. So tell us that story as a way of getting at the numbers behind this. How big a problem are we facing and do you think most people understand it? Well, you know, one of the biggest least kept secrets in Washington is that, uh, at least when it comes to the student loan program, is that the accounting has been really off. Some people will say basically Congress is cooking the, the books here. Um, but for years and years and years, Congress has scored this program, meaning the budget estimate that they pass every year, says that taxpayers are going to make a profit on student loans. And what ends up happening is Congress every year uh, says, yes, we're going to make a profit on this latest cohort. And then at the end of the year, uh, the amount of money that students send in to the education department to, pay their, to repay their loans comes in low. And so basically, Treasury has to transfer all this money at the end of the year after the congressional oversight pro process. And so during the Trump administration, uh, they, they basically hired some outside experts to come in and look at the books and say, okay, what's going on here? Why are these estimates so far off? And what, and some of these people who came in, one of them was from J, JP Morgan. Um, and so he had experience. He actually ran their student loan branch at one point. And he basically looked at the budget assumptions that Congress and the executive branch uses and said, this is insane. Um, if the private sector used these assumptions, we would never get away with this. Um, we would essentially be, essentially be lying to our investors. And so, for example, I'll just give you one example. Um, as you probably know, do, do a lot of students end up defaulting on their loans. It's one of the features of this program, and defaults have been exceptionally high for years. And what ends up happening with the student loan program, if you default on a loan, Oftentimes what happens is, is uh, the education department rolls you into a new loan. Um, and so it's called, a, it, in some cases, it's called a rehab loan, where, where basically they say, okay, we'll put you to, into a new loan with new terms. And oftentimes the person never really makes a payment when they transition over into the new loan. And yet, according to this report that these outside experts did, those new loans are considered a payoff. In other words, Congress 
and its budget estimates is considering that student having pay, successfully paid off the loan, even though they're simply getting into a new loan and they haven't paid a dime. Okay, you know, that is insane. <laughs> I'm sorry? I said that is insane. <laughs> it's insane. It's insane. Um, and so, and according to my sources, you know, these experts went to the folks that crunched the numbers in the education department and said, why are you doing it this way? And they kind of said like, oops, you know. Um, and so that's just one example. There are a lot of other examples. Like for example, you know, like you have to estimate how much people are going to earn over their lifetime, how much, how quickly our income is going to grow. And so a lot of these, the, this private sector team, they were actually hired. So they weren't exactly outside experts. They came from the outside in. Um, they basically said, these are much more, you know, use our assumptions. These are, this is how the private sector would, would calculate this program. And by the way, it's no longer making profit. This is actually going to be very costly in the long run. Um, so <clears throat> that's actually quite scary um, that, that that was the accounting system that the government was using for this program. And I want to come back to this notion of how much the entire student loan program has been about accounting obfuscations. But we're going to we're going to come back to that and, 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 and get there, get there in a little bit. Um, I wanted to back up to the very beginning of all of this and start with your, your this great anecdote you have about this day in 1957, right after the Russians launched Sputnik and where Lyndon Johnson was and so let's start with the lovely thing, the intentions around student loans. What, what was this supposed to do? And what was Johnson thinking on that day? Right. So the origins of the student loan program go to the space race. Um, so 1957, the Soviet Union launches Sputnik and LBJ is at the ranch hosting, you know, he and Lady Bird are hosting some friends the news comes about, they go outside, they look up in the sky and LBJ basically says, oh no. Um, and he wrote in his autobiography, he was just stunned because you have to keep in mind, this was only about a decade after World War II, we were sort of known, we had really risen as, as a country in the global economy. We were the most ro robust you know, uh, country um, out there. And um, this really you know, sort of sent him and a lot of other members of Congress back. Um, and he basically said, uh, if we're going to reclaim the lead in the space race and our global role in the economy, we have to invest in higher education. We have to get more scientists and engineers out there um, to, to reclaim the lead in the space race. And so less than a year later, Congress passed the uh, first student loan program. Um, and it, it was called the National Defense Education Act. So, you know, uh, at first this was done in the name of national de defense. Um, LBJ gets into office, you know, in 1965 and I'm sorry, um, 1963, um, don't, don't quote me on that. Um, he gets into office and, uh, you know, after L JFK obviously dies and, um, and he decides to turn to higher education for a much broader role, which was to level inequality. Um, obviously he wanted to give everyone, uh, you know, including the poor and the middle class a chance to you know, um, to, to go to college. And so very quickly, you know, this narrow program of, you know, with this narrow goal of reclaiming the space race became this really broad goal of let's, you know, like fix all the societal ills, let's level inequality. Um, and so just higher education really, its role expanded quickly. <clears throat> So do you think that the flaw was in the original conception of the program, or do you think the original idea was corrupted over time? In other words, is this a story of good intentions which were destined to go wrong, or is this a story of good intentions that got twisted over time? That's a very good question. Uh, the first thing I want to answer to that question is that Congress never really decide, never really came to a consensus of should everyone go to college? Um, basically, when you look at, you know, the testimony back then, when you look at what people were writing and saying, there was this phrase like people who are able to succeed in college are like people of academic ability. Let's let's give everyone of academic ability the chance to go to college. And then it kind of sort of morphed into everyone go to college. And so it, it kind of morphed over time. And actually, LBJ, I think, was the first president who said higher education is no longer an option. It's now a necessity. Um, and so, you know, I think we kind of skipped over that whole discussion of whether everyone should go to college. It just sort of came to be. 
Um, now, I do think that it got, I do think that there was a very pivotal moment in 1965 when uh, LBJ pushed Congress to create the, what was called the Guaranteed Student Loan Program. This is basically the loan program we know now. Yeah. Um, the origins of that particular program was in 1965. And he turned to banks. And this is what I argue in my book was a pivotal moment in United States history, at least when it came to education. And there's sort of a wonky reason for this. If if you indulge me, can I just geek out a little bit here? Absolutely, geeking out okay. is encouraged. Um, okay, I just don't don't want people's eyes to close over, but I think this is important. So the way the government uh, calculated spending every year, any cash that came out was considered spending. Any cash that came out of the treasury which meant that if you wanted to do a wide scale student loan program, that would actually look very exp expensive on the front end. If you wanted to originate a billion dollars in student loans in a given year, spending would go up by that much. And so it just looked really expensive. And keep in mind, this was at a moment in time when LBJ was pushing Congress to create these other programs um, that were also costly. The Vietnam War was uh, going to be ramping up. And so it, it, spending was becoming a concern. And so he said, okay, what is, how can I expand access to higher education without, you know, causing the deficit to go up? Oh, let's just have banks do it. And if banks originate the loans, that's, that's not going to show up on taxpayers' books. Um, so he turned to banks. Now, banks don't necessarily always do things out of, the, out of the goodness of their hearts. You know, their whole reason for being is to make money. And so this is where I argue um, higher education became blended with a with the motive to make profits off of college students. And things kind of went off track really quickly from there. But to answer your question, I do think this became pretty quickly co-opted. Not not it took a while, but as soon as banks figured out how to make money, that's when things went off the rails. <clears throat> So it's interesting that there were almost two kinds of obfuscation baked into this from the very beginning. And one was not having the difficult conversation around who sh should everybody go to college? And if so, who should pay for it? We just skipped all of that. And the second kind of ob obfuscation was the accounting one, obviously, that we are going to play a game and pretend that this was free and that it, that it wasn't costing money. How much do you, going back to, to your, your point at the start of this, how much do you think that this is a story of accounting obfuscation? Because there are other decisions that were made along the way that also has allowed the government to pretend that it was making money on a program on which it's not. Huge. And I would say it's more than obfuscation. It's like the opposite of what they intended to do. Like they, they said they were doing this to save money. They were actually costing taxpayers a lot of money. And right. that's what I find. That was probably the most bizarre thing I found out in this whole book is like this whole program was created to to you know, avoid doing any type of accounting of this program. Um, <clears throat> and so it had the opposite effect of just driving up costs. Um, and, and that is a recurring theme throughout history. You know, Congress has these bold goals to help their constituents. And so that's where the good intentions come into play. Um, but they want to do it always in like the cheapest way they can. And again, by cheapest way, I'm referring to what's on paper, not necessarily real money, but like budgetary, you know, reasons to make it look cheap. And that, you know, if you want to talk about why was bankruptcy taken away from students, you know, why, you know, why did they create Sally May in 1972? Um, all, a lot of the decisions that happened over time were, were the motivation was to provide access to higher education in the cheapest way possible on paper. And that's where I think Congress really shot itself in the foot a lot of times is they just didn't really think long term about the decisions they were making. Right. To provide access to higher education in what looked what, what could be made to look like the cheapest way possible, but actually yes. had nothing to do with rea in reality. And worse yet, I think your point is nothing to do with actually helping students um, right. um, mm -hmm. um, with in, in a system that came to be more um, exploitative of students than, than anything else. Um, I, I, I want to continue on. I want to come back to that thread. But uh, you write in your book that this program is essentially um, the epitome of crony capitalism. You write it's the quintessential form of crony capitalism. Explain what you mean by that. So, well, I'm, when I was writing that, I thought of Sally May. Um, so let me just go a little bit into detail about Sally May. So inflation 
was really causing problems uh, in the 60s uh, when it came to a lot of things, but particularly also with lending because uh, banks just weren't making enough money off of student loans to continue the program um, because of, in part because of inflation. And so uh, Congress said, okay, we're going to create this for profit company called Sally May. This is, you know, a so-called government sponsored enterprise, but basically it was a corporation that took taxpayer money, which it then gave to banks to put in the hands of students to give to schools. And in turn, Sally May, once it figured out how to operate the student loan industry quite efficiently, which it did do by the 80s, this became a huge profit center um, for investors on Wall Street. Sally May joins the NASDAQ, um, I'm sorry, the New York Stock Exchange in the 83. Um, and you know, so Wall Street starts to make a lot of money off of this program. Schools start to make a lot of money off this program. And so Sally Mae was like operating in this like really efficient manner, growing, you know, leaps and bounds in the 80s. And you know, so I, I caught up with like the first four CEOs of Sally Mae, and they're all extremely proud of how they ran the company. And they're very proud about you know being featured in Business Week and you know, just how high their stocks was going. And I confronted all of them and I said, you know, you guys didn't really have much risk from a financial perspective. I mean, you were basically taking taxpayer money at first and just, you know, you were a funnel to banks, but like you didn't have to sort of find money. You were like, you had a direct line of credit from the treasury department. And even when you, you know, raised money from investors, you know, you had this like so-called implicit guarantee where investors assumed that if you ever were in trouble, the government would bail you out, which they ended up doing later on. But point is, is that a lot of the decision making, um, they didn't have a lot of quote unquote financial risk. And so in a healthy capitalistic market, businesses have to share in that risk. Um, and, Sa and Sally Mae didn't have that. Um, and I, I, I focus a lot on Sally Mae because they ended up being the biggest you know, lender out there. And I, I agree they were the, the financial backbone of the higher education system, but they weren't the only one. Um, but, but that's what I mean by crony capitalism is that, you know, you're basically just taking taxpayer money um, and finding a way to profit off of it. And, and there's not really any thought or, or risk that you're taking on. <clears throat> I remember being so totally shocked as a young reporter when I learned about the existence of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and what was supposedly a capitalist society that you actually had these entities that were functioning with, with government guarantees and putting taxpayers at risk, yet making a ton of money for people in, in, in the private sector. And by, by the way, paying their executives uh, exorbitant amounts too. And it, it strikes me in reading your book that Sally Mae in some ways was almost one step worse than Fannie and Freddie. And I'd love for you to react to that. And what, what, I, mean, what I mean by that is that Sally was both a little more secretive and not, that's not necessarily the company's fault. It's just that people understood it less well. It had an equally friendly name, Sally Mae. How sweet, how, how, how nice. But then Sally also, also told people that it had privatized itself without ever acknowledging that that, that privatization still resulted in government guaranteed profits. Right. And I, I've almost come to think of Sally, if you, if you dislike Fannie and Freddie, then you've got to hate Sally and Sally Mae, at least the old Sally Mae. At least that's how I came to see it. Do you agree with that? Uh, well, let me just put it this way. I mean, and I've, you know, again, I confronted Al Lord, who was the swashbuckling CEO of Sally Mae in the 2000s, you know, with this, with this point, which I think is to your point. Um, there was no underwriting with student loans. And that's where I think it's actually worse than uh, housing. You know, at least with housing, even though like in the housing bubble, and you know this way more than I do, having written a book about this, but there was some underwriting, like the banks did something to review, you know, someone's credit. They, they looked at the assessed value of the home. Now the value of the home was oftentimes like way out of whack, but like at least there was some type of review process. Like Sally Mae and banks, you know, the review process for getting a student loan was pressing a computer key. That, that's it. Um, and so they didn't have to do any type of assessment of anyone's ability to repay. Now they had to track payments to see, you know, to make sure that the government repaid them when students defaulted. And, you know, Sally Mae was really good at putting technology into schools to, you know, make it easy and speedy for students to apply for student loans. And, you know, they, they did a lot of good things along those lines. But um, yeah, there was, again, there was no underwriting here. And so this is where I think it's actually worse than the housing market. Um, and 
to get to your first point about like sort of how Sally Mae conducted itself. So very quickly in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, member of con members of Congress basically started saying, I think we screwed up here. I think like this is just getting way out of hand. I mean, why are we giving all these profits to banks and Sally Mae? This, what did we do here? Let's just have the Treasury Department make loans and cut out the banking industry. And at least we'll save all of the money that we're having to give banks to twist their arms to give loans to students. Sally Mae fought back very quickly. Um, and, you know, one of the shocking things that, you know, I report in the book is their chief uh, congressional ally was this congressman from Michigan named Bill Ford. He was the head of the education panel in the House. And, you know, he was like the main go to guy on higher education policy. And he was their chief ally, chief, Salome's chief, chief protector. Um, for years and years and years, you know, people were, would say, like, why are we doing this? Why are we protecting them? Let's just cut them out. And I had multiple people say um, the chief lobbyist for Sally Mae was having a romantic relationship with uh, Bill Ford. And, you know, I, I, I verified that through as many people as possible, including, including um, Al Lord, including who was the CFO in the 80s. Um, including the chief of staff for Bill Ford, who Bill Ford's no longer with us. But um, point is, is that they were they they acted very in in a very corrupt way at times. Um, I don't think there's any way you can sort of you know avoid saying that. <clears throat> it's, it's it's interesting. I mean, the definition of crony capitalism, right? But it's also interesting because over the years, Fannie Mae, when it was a powerful company before it got taken over by the government in 2008, got a lot of criticism um, for its lobbying. And when I read your book and thought about the various forms of lobbying that Sally, it, Sally engaged in and the behind the scenes influence that company wielded, it just made me think about, see, about the secrecy with which Sally conducted itself and wonder yeah. how much of that was accidental and how much, how there much was planned. There was a story, I don't know if it made it in the book, but there was a story, I talked with the guy who was working for the CBO or the GAO, one of the agencies, and he was doing a, a report in the early 80s, just calculating how much profits Sally Mae was making. And he said that like his boss got this chilling call from like someone from Sally Mae saying, don't you dare uh, be harsh on us in this report. It was like, who was Sally Mae to like, basically threatened Congress, you know, threatened this congressional agency, you know, to not make them look bad. And yet, you know, they're making so much money off of taxpayers. You know, that, that was a really eye-opening example that I discovered. <clears throat> that, that, that is eye-opening indeed. So I, I, was, I was thinking as we were talking that another big difference between the mortgage business and the student loan business is that at least in the mortgage business, when a homeowner defaults, they can get out from under their mortgage in bankruptcy. And so the lender bears some of the risk because the homeowner can always declare bankruptcy. Uh, the student loan business is different. And there are two components to that. One is that that um, on a government guaranteed loan, if you default, right, you, you, that debt can follow you for the rest of your life. But then this thing called the private student loan business also came into being. And somehow, which I don't understand how that happened in 2005, the lenders got that covered under the same law such that you can't walk away from a private student loan either. So this is a two part question because I'm not sure everyone here understands the difference between a government guaranteed loan and a, and a private loan. But I thought maybe ex explain that difference and then tell us how on earth did the student loan industry manage to get not just the government guaranteed loans um, um, effectively guaranteed for, for life, but also their private loans to be something that people that can haunt you and to, and just that can be deducted from your social security. Right. So this was a process that took place really over 30 or 40 years. Congress just gradually whittled away students' rights to declare bankruptcy. In the 1970s, apparently there was a rise in people declaring bankruptcy on their student loans. Um, some of that surely was because for-profit schools were coming about. There was a big for-profit scandal in the 70s um, as Vietnam veterans came back from the war and um, as the student loan program really got ramped up, you know, uh, companies started to see this could be a big profit center. And so people were going to these for-profit schools and defaulting, although it wasn't just for-profit schools. There were also people who were defaulting on their loans having gone to nonprofit schools. Point being, there was a rise in bankruptcies. I think the New York Times had like a front page story at some point that spooked Congress. 
this idea, you know, there were there were um, members of Congress and policymakers saying, oh, these students are coming out and they look indigent on paper because they're young and they have this, you know, loan hanging over them and they might not necessarily get a, you know, a, a starting job with a high pay. So they look indigent, therefore they're taking advantage of the bankruptcy system even though in reality, they're going to end up making a lot of money five years from now, 10 years from now, you know, they, they viewed this as like the bankruptcy law. There was this quirk that allowed students to take advantage of a loophole. Um, and so, and also, I mean, you can't ignore the fact that when students default um, and declare bankruptcy, you know, again, that costs money from the taxpayer's pers perspective, because ultimately Congress has to account for those losses. <clears throat> um, and so um, they started to whittle away the rights of students. Um, basically, there was a, a little bit of a higher threshold that they set in the late 70s. And then in the 90s, they raised the threshold. I think it was like at some point you had to show that you've made good faith payments for seven years and then you can declare bankruptcy. And then eventually they said, OK, now we're just going to force you to sh do um, show judges that you face an undue hardship which is this phrase that was never really defined, but judges interpreted that in a really strict way to basically make it almost impossible to declare bankruptcy on your loans, or at least that was the perception. It's not quite impossible. It's just really hard to declare bankruptcy on your loans under that standard. And private banks, including Sally May, said, okay, well, this isn't fair. Okay, if, if federal loans, if students can't declare bankruptcy on their federal loans, then why should you know, private lenders be treated differently than the federal loan program, you know, treat us the same way. And so they successfully argued that in 2005. Um, just, now, yeah, go ahead. I can't believe they got away with that because well, obviously, and, they, obviously they should be treated differently. I can make a case for a federal student loan perhaps not being forgiven, but a private loan made by a private lender that it falls under that same statute seems insane to me. I feel like uh, I that word too often. <laughs> and keep in mind, this was at a time when there was a lot of risky, reckless lending going on on the both the private and federal side of student loans. But I show in my book that, you know, Sally Mae was was really, you know, intertwined closely with the for profit college sector in the early 2000s. Yeah. Um, and a lot of those loans just are now toxic debt. Um, you know, no one no one's repaying them. And, and yet, you know, a lot of students can't get out of them because of that law. <clears throat> I, I want to go to that next, which is this intertwined history of Sally May and the for profit um, education complex and how you came to think of for profit schools as you reported this book, because I had I had written a little bit about it back in the early 2000s. And there was a huge debate that, well, these schools enable people who wouldn't have an opportunity to go to college otherwise to get their chance. So therefore, they're, they're good, and we should encourage them. And I hadn't realized until I read your book that this was a debate that stretched back to the 60s and 70s. And this industry has repeatedly blown up um, um, in scams and bad, bad debt. So how, how did you come to think of for profits after after writing this book? Well, actually, the first big for profit scandal was after the GI Bill. Uh -huh. um, you know, saying this goes back to 1944, 45, uh, you know, they passed the GI Bill, all these veterans, all of a sudden, the VA would give, would basically, if you were a veteran, you had a voucher, but instead of a student loan, which is also a voucher, it was actually a cash grant. So the veteran didn't have to repay it, but um, the VA would directly pay schools that cash grant. And so all of these quote unquote entrepreneurs started, you know, opening these for-profit schools right after the GI Bill. Same thing happened in the 70s when the student loan program started to expand and in the 80s. Um, every single time that there's been an opportunity to, you know, make new forms of money, you know, to, to have a new cash stream, uh, for profit schools have responded very quickly. I mean, have you, I don't know if you saw the part of my book about these correspondence schools, yes. which is bizarre. I mean, this was like basically correspondence schools. I didn't even know about these. They were you know, like, basically the school would mail you materials at home and you would like kind of fill out the materials at home and that would be your coursework. And so it was kind of like online learning before online learning, but these schools were huge, like getting, making hundreds of millions of dollars off this program. Um, and uh, so what's fascinating, though, about for-profit schools is in the 80s, the politics were completely reversed from what we see now. 
In the 80s, the Democrats, particularly in these blue collar states, including blue, uh, Bill Ford, who I mentioned, he was a Michigan Democrat, um, you know, and he obviously represented a lot of auto workers. Um, they, the, the Democrats, Ted Kennedy, Bill Ford said, no, these schools are providing opportunity for blue collar workers. A lot of these blue collar workers, you know, are older, they can't get into, you know, your, your typical four year state school. Um, they need an opportunity. Um, the global economy is changing. Uh, you know, um, blue collar jobs are falling. White collar jobs are rising. We need to give, you know, these 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 out of work blue collar workers the opportunity to get an education for profit schools are catering to them. They're great. And it was the Republicans, including Bill Bennett, um, the education secretary for from Ronald Reagan in the 80s. He said, no, they're fleecing taxpayers. You know, we've, we've got to cut them out of the program. They're taking advantage of students. They're taking advantage of this program. It was only in the 90s and 2000s that the politics reversed and Republicans started to align with these big corporations that started opening up for profit schools and Democrats started saying, no, these for profit schools are really taking advantage of people. Um, so, yes, this has been an issue. This has been a debate over time. Um, there is this question, though, is have the has the public sector have public schools ramped up quickly enough to handle the influx of students um, that are going to for profit schools? You know, I do think there's a legit argument to say that for profit schools do in some ways pick up the slack that the public sector um, isn't doing. <clears throat> That's really interesting. I remember speaking of Republicans and Democrats. I remember the famous John Boehner quote to the for-profit industry, right? We have you in the palm of our hand. Yep. It's something along those lines. Essentially, we're, we're, we're going to protect you. But on that note, you, in one of the things you detail in your book is that there's been pretty, plenty of profiteering by the ostensibly not-for-profit schools as, as well. And so when you think about the the both how we address the very real need for education to your point about the not-for-profit sector not exactly picking up the slack here, but also apportioning the blame in, in where we are now between yes, for-profits that have used, uh, that have marketed aggressively to students and made promises about their educations, that the, what their educations will get them that they haven't been able to keep. But then what 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 not-for-profit schools have also done with, with federal money, which essentially has just been to create this vicious circle of raising, of constantly escalating tuition prices that necessitate students taking out bigger and bigger loans, therefore leading to more and more escalation in tuition prices, all the while paying themselves hefty, hefty, hefty salaries and, you know, using the federal money to offer students steak dinners and water parks and not exactly a better education. So be, between these two sectors, the not-for-profits and the for-profits, are, are there any heroes here? Uh, goodness, that's a great question. Yes, yes, there are. Um, oh, but good. before I get to that, can I, can I, uh, can I sort of address an, a fundamental aspect of the student loan program that I think really explains what you just described? Yes. Um, I spoke with Alice Rivlin, obviously, you know, she was a former budget director under Clinton and this just really well-known le legendary economist in DC. Um, she was in the Johnson administration in 1969, and they were really, uh, she was tasked with coming up with this big blueprint um, to decide how the United States would finance higher education, um, you know, for years and years and years. And so she basically, the, the decision that her panel faced was, do we basically have the system of free college or do we go, do we continue to go with student loans? And the panel ultimately said, let's stick with student loans. All of these college groups said, no, 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 don't give students the money, give schools the money. And policymakers were skeptical of giving schools the money. They wanted to empower students. But there were some, in some cases, schools basically saying, if you set up the student loan system, you're going to incentivize schools to raise their prices. And they were kind of like warning. They were, they were warning Congress and policymakers, like, you know, you're, you're going to create this perverse incentive here. And you're going to basically have the, the tail wagging the dog because, you know, you're just going to continue to give more and more money to students and we're just going to raise our prices and it's going to be a never ending cycle. Alice Rivlin thought, no, you know, if, if students have the money, you know, we will empower them as consumers and schools will have to compete on price and quality. And instead, what ended up happening is the opposite. Schools did not compete on price. They, well, they did, but they actually competed on high price. They wanted to see who could raise their prices the highest in a lot of ways. Um, and this is because there was this notion that came about in the 1980s that if the higher your price, the more prestigious you are as a school, the better quality your school is. Um, 
And so schools started to compete on prestige and started to compete on like raising the prices. Um, and students just assumed they took it as an article of faith that, you know, the more expensive the school is, the better the school is. Um, and so that's one of those instances of where, you know, um, you had this like one intention and, and things ended up being completely the opposite of what they intended. So tell me about who the heroes are. Well, I, I think that there are reform minded people now who are really trying to uh, figure out ways to better finance our education and make sure that students, um, you know, number one, are better aware of what they're getting into, but also, you know, making sure that they're prepared for the workforce and that, um, you know, schools are cutting their own costs so that they don't have to continue to charge so much. So like, for example, there's this HBCU in Texas um, that, I, that I went to visit uh, Paul Quinn College, and I, I spoke with a man named Michael Sorrell. He's actually pretty well known by now um, as this reform-minded guy. Um, this HBC was really in trouble uh, about 10 or 12 years ago. They were running out of money. Enrollment was falling. And by the way, students were taking on really huge amount of debts, uh, disproportionately poor Black students. Um, and he said, we can't do this anymore. And the first thing he did was cut the football program. And he got a, he got a lot of pushback. But he said, there's no point in us, um, you know, um, having this football program. Yes, it's great. It's fun. But that's I'm not going to have these students get into debt so that we can have a football team. Um, he did things like an instituted a dress code. He's, you know, so that students would be prepared for the workforce so that they went to a job interview. They were just looked really nice and polished and knew how to carry themselves. He, um, most importantly, you know, got some of these corporations, including FedEx and, and these other companies near his college to basically give students internships so that um, the students would have money to pay the tuition. The, coll the colleges or the companies agreed to pay the tuition or at least part of the tuition so that students wouldn't have to get in so much debt. And there are, have been some positive results of all this experimenting that he's been doing. But that gets to this broader point that I make in my book, which is that if you really want to reform this program, I think you have to, at, at least among a lot of the lawmakers that I talk to and a lot of the policymakers and experts that I've talked to and what I've witnessed, you have to have schools have more skin in the game and suffer consequences if um, their students default. And when schools are pushed to do that, I think they can become more innovative than what we've seen. I worry that what you're discussing is still the exception, not the rule. But before right. we get to some of what some of the fixes might be, I want to go back to this moment in 2010, which I think is another important moment in the history of student loans for two reasons. One is that President Obama um, got rid of essentially the guaranteed student loan program and replaced it with a direct lending program, right, that had been started under Clinton in order to cut Sally May essentially out of out of out of and the banks out of out of that part of the business. And I'd okay. love to hear you address whether that whether that was the right thing to do. Um, but it also enabled yet another accounting obfuscation, right? Um, sure. So let's, let's talk about both parts of that. Sure. So there's this huge backstory that I find really fascinating where starting in the 1990s, there were these two loan programs under the federal government, and they were competing with each other. One was sort of the guaranteed program that Sally May and the banks were controlling, and the other was this program that Clinton started to have the Treasury Department um, make loans. And so each program had its own congressional allies. And so basically, Congress, in this really bizarre way, said, let's have two programs compete against each other. And schools got to decide, you know, which program they steered students toward. And there was this big fight for 20 years. And finally, Barack Obama said, you know, this is nonsense. Um, you know, why do we need two programs? Let's go with the cheaper one, which is the Treasury Direct Loan Program, because under that program, again, the money comes directly out of the Treasury Department. We don't have to pay banks and Sally May. Uh, we don't have to guarantee them a certain return, you know, to make student loans. And so it did save taxpayers money in that respect. Again, Sally May and the banks, by not having to do any type of assessment of borrowers' ability to repay, they were simply a funnel. Um, and uh, they were the middleman, so to speak. And if you just cut them out, then you're, you're instantly saving money. What I do argue is that that didn't solve any of the underlying fundamental problems. It saved taxpayers money, but it, it really kept in place um, this system that we have where you can go to any school at any price, anywhere in the country, regardless of your ability to, and, and take on tens of thousands, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt 
without any regard to your ability to repay. That was an issue under the guaranteed program. It's an issue under the direct loan program. The eligibility criteria are so low and so loose that it's just so easy for families to get into a lot of debt. And I think um, it kept that fundamental problem in place. <clears throat> Did it actually save uh, taxpayers money or did it just appear to save taxpayers money? Because you also recount in the book how much student loans grew, the, the horrible irony of how much student debt grew under during Obama's presidency. Yeah, it depends on what your counterfactual is. I mean, it saved taxpayers money in the sense that if you had the exact same program that we do now, but it was still administered by banks and Sally May, you would have all of the costs on top of, you would have all the same costs on top of the interest that you had to pay Salome and the banks. So it saved money from the perspective of you no longer had to pay the middlemen. Um, but as I mentioned earlier at the start of this um, call is that, you know, the program grew so quickly for a lot of different reasons. You know, um, I, I actually used to make this mistake and a lot of people still make this mistake that, you know, a lot of people think, oh, what Obama did led to this explosion of student debt. It did not. Um, there were just a lot of things going on at that moment in time that created this explosion of student debt, including this most severe recession since the Great Depression, college enrollment soared. Now, Obama did encourage people to go to college. So, you know, you can lay that at his feet if you want to, you know, sort of blame him for being too optimistic about, you know, what college could do for individuals. You know, that's that's OK if you want to blame him for that. But simply switching to a direct loan program did not lead to this explosion in lending in and of itself. Um, but uh, yeah, no, as I, as I point out, um, you know, what ended up happening is a lot of students did take on debt that they couldn't repay, repayment rates fell. And then one of the things that Obama did was he said, okay, let's prevent people from defaulting by putting into, them into these new income-based repayment plans, which basically turned a lot of these loans into 25-year loans instead of 10. So you spread the payments over time, prevents them from defaulting. But in some cases, it's costing taxpayers um, because this is this is sort of a form of forgiveness program in some cases. But in some cases, it's actually driving up the balances of students. Um, but anyways, yeah. <clears throat> it seems to me like yet another part of this 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 story is one after the other, good intentions gone wrong, right? Yep. Um, and until you recount this moment where um, Larry Summers and Larry Katz kind of decide that this is the way to get out of the recession by encouraging more people to go to college. Which, which seems like a laudable goal, except it didn't exactly pan out that way, right? Right. And again, this gets to that underlying question, like, is college for everyone? Should everyone go to college? Um, you know, who benefits from college? Which colleges do people benefit going to? Um, so the recession was really severe, obviously, in 2008 uh, through 2010. Unemployment, even after the recession, was exceptionally high. It hit young people particularly hard. And so Larry Summers um, and, and Barack Obama and Rahm Emanuel really felt like this would be a great time for everyone to go to school. Um, this, this came on the heels of other countries like South Korea overtaking us in this global lead for having the edu most educated workforce. And so in a really interesting way, Obama was kind of like LBJ where he had this like anxiety about the United States standing in the, in the global economy. LBJ was worried about the Soviet Union. Um, Barack Obama was worried about like South Korea and other emerging economies, you know, who were who were really investing in higher education. And so he basically said his first major speech to Congress was he said, I ask everyone to spend at least a year in higher education. It doesn't necessarily have to be a four year school, um, but it has to be some type of college training. That's what the current economy requires. And let's let's hope by 2020 we can regain the lead as having the uh, world's most educated workforce. Now. What's interesting is that President Obama really understood that student loans were a burden for a lot of people. He, he got, you know, I don't know if you recall, but he would like read letters routinely from his constituents. And I think he had some, you know, routine where he would lean, read like one letter a day or five letters a day. There was an author who wrote a book about this. Um, and a lot of those letters were from students, people who were saying, um, I'm taking on all these loans and they're just really a burden for me. And Barack Obama himself and Michelle Obama had student loans from law school. And so he was very aware of this issue. Um, and so, you know, and he, he really tried to do a number of things to ease the burden. But I do argue that in the long run, his, his bold plan to, you know, sort of educate, you know, America out of the recession 
inherently relied on student loans. <clears throat> And inherently furthered the problem of escalating tuition, right? Of apparently free money for colleges, just furthering sure. this vicious cycle of, of, of rising tuition. Mm -hmm. um, I want to get to, which leads us to where we are now, which is the current push for, for loan forgiveness. How, how do you think about that? Because I can argue it both ways. Yes, loan forgiveness makes, makes some sense given, that, given how exploitative and predatory the system has been in some ways. On the other hand, there's some numbers showing that it would disproportionately actually benefit high earners because it's high earners who hold, who hold most of the debt. And then there's how do you do this in a fair way? Um, how, so how, did you, how do you think about that issue of loan forgiveness, which is right now on the table? Yeah, there are several points. Uh, first of all, one one thing I I one thought I constantly go back to is that if a lot of this debt was on the private sector's books, private banks would have had to written it off, wrote, wrote it, written it off by now. Um, and whereas the government doesn't have to do do that, I mean, some of these some of these loans and some of these defaults have been on the government's books for decades, um, and so. One argument for loan forgiveness is to basically have the government acknowledge some of this debt is not going to get repaid, which is what the private sector would have to do itself. Yep. Um, now, I, I do think uh, you make a good point that, um, you know, basically any way you cut it, if you're looking at it from uh, household income, uh, loan forgiveness, whether it's $10,000, $50,000 or complete loan forgiveness is going to look, uh, quote unquote, progressive. That being said, um, you know, ten thousand dollars. Most defaults on student loans are people who owe less than ten thousand dollars. Wow! I now that's a that. bit that's a bit counterintuitive because yeah. you know you would think most defaults happen when people are one hundred fifty thousand dollars in debt, but actually, a lot of people who owe five or eight thousand, they went to their local community college, they went to a six month certificate program. Oftentimes, they didn't. Um, stay and they didn't earn the certificate or the degree that they meant to meant to earn and so they drop out um, and so they have the the worst of both worlds they have student debt but they don't have the degree to get the jobs that the debt was designed to get them right and so those are the ones most likely to default interest accrues and it really hangs over their heads you know for years and years and years and so ten thousand dollars would address that issue it would wipe out the vast majority of loans that people are defaulting on. Um, now, the bigger question is, okay, so like, what do you do for next fall's cohort of students? Because they're just gonna take out more and more loans. And if you forgive a trillion dollars in loans, we'll be back to 1.6 trillion within four or five years. Right. And so, you know, the I think that there's this fundamental question that Congress is avoiding. Um, Once again. Know, Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it seems to me, based on what you've said and based on, on reading your book, that while loan forgiveness would be salutary both for students and for perhaps finally afford, forcing the government to acknowledge the reality of the losses of the student loan program, if we don't engage in some fundamental rethinking at the same time, the whole vicious circle is just going to start again, um, perhaps in an even more vicious way, because now with the knowledge that the government's got got Got, got everybody's back um, or the taxpayers have everybody back. And so that almost feels like if you don't tie it to some kind of reform of, of the system, it, it doesn't feel like a great answer. Would you, yeah. would you agree with that? Yeah. And I think that we're going through the debate as a society. I get the sense. I mean, you, we saw this in the presidential campaign. Um, this is kind of like healthcare was in 2008, 2009. Um, and Congress took a stab at healthcare reform under you know, President Obama. Um, you know, I do get the sense we we might be headed down that path, particularly because even under the, under the government's accounting that I was criticizing earlier, or at least pointing out that you know there's it's been very very much off. Um, even under that accounting, this is becoming a costlier and costlier program, and so I have to imagine at some point um, Congress is going to pay attention to that.
and maybe and maybe look at ways to address some of the problems I lay out in, in my book. <clears throat> or maybe just come up with yet another accounting obfuscation or another change of rules in order to create profits out of thin air, right? <laughs> um, we, so we have some questions from the audience that I want to get to before it's too late. Um, technical vocational schools were the backbone in lower income communities. They were subsidized by the government, but they're almost non-existent today. What what happened to them? And are they, in your view, part of part of what should be the solution? Well, again, I think that's where the for-profit college sector really tried to enter into that space. I do think that there have been some positive developments in recent years. First of all, the for-profit college sector has shrunk, and I'm, I don't take the I don't make the argument that all for-profit colleges are bad. I just want to make that clear. Um, I may disagree with you there, but that's okay. <laughs> it's fair, fair. Um, but but uh, I, I I wrote a story uh, a year ago about this program in Kentucky where private employers, including Toyota, are pairing with the local community college to, to really do apprenticeship style courses. And these are like one-year courses and the median salary five years out is $95,000 in Kentucky. Um, and I do think employers are really, you know, more and more starting to sort of step up and try and experiment with these things. I think because number one, they're a little disappointed in sort of the higher education system yeah. Um, but also employers, you know, haven't picked up enough slack themselves. And I think they're realizing that if they really want, you know, a more, a, a better workforce, they have to start investing in training as well. So I do think that there's definitely a bigger role for vocational schools. And I think more experimenting in the private sector is happening right now to address that gap. <clears throat> Yeah. I was I was being a little bit flip, actually. I, I am not sure in this system, going back to the question I'd asked you earlier, if there really are any any heroes. It seems that the system we've set up is one in which all the players respond to the economic incentives in front of them, right? And the economic so. and the economic incentives across both the for-profit and the ostensibly not-for-profit system are to get students in your door paying as much as you can possibly charge them without any regard for their ability to repay. And something in that dynamic needs to fundamentally change. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, one of my chapters dealt with the University of Alabama, and I got an email recently from a woman who recently graduated from Alabama. I talk about how Alabama has become like this huge school that now is composed mostly of out-of-state students who are paying, in some cases, double or triple the rate of in-state tuition, uh, but because they're out-of-state, they, they pay way, way more, and therefore, parents increasingly are getting into debt at the state flagship school that was the alma mater of Carl Elliott, the Democrat who sponsored the National Defense Education Act, the first student loan program. Um, and she said, this woman who emailed me said, like, you're, way, you're being way too harsh. Like, you're, you're, not, you're not considering the fact that Alabama does actually pay, um, give a lot of scholarship money to people like me who have, you know, have, have done well on tests and scored high and, and have high grades and we work really hard. So this is the so-called merit scholarships. And I don't, you know, take a position. I'm, I'm still a journal reporter. So I don't take a position on this like, you know, needs based versus merit based aid issue. What I do point out in my book, I, I think that there are a lot of students who fall through the cracks. Yeah. And so there are students giving aid to really try to help them out. But ultimately, once that aid money runs out, the school's bottom line becomes paramount. And if students are poor or even middle class and they have to take on tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt, I've just discovered schools don't really bat an eyelash at that. They, they give you the, they say the right things. They say, we really feel bad about that and we're trying our best to deal with it. But the reality is every single year, these schools are packaging loans through the student loan program, um, giving families debt that they know full well, they're, they're not going to be able to repay. And this is a feature of the system. It's not a bug. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think it preys on what I worry about is that it preys on people's naivete and sort of the sales pitch that is similar to the mortgage pitch, which is this is what you should do. Take on this debt. It's going to give you a better life. Take on this debt, buy a home. This is what this is what you're supposed to do. And it it preys on people's economic naivete um, in, a, in, a, in a really dangerous way. I was um, going to guarantee a loan for a young friend of mine, and she is a young woman who's smart, a black black girl, um, single mother. And I, she asked me to get, guarantee her loan so she could get it to attend Penn State. And this was just a couple of days ago. And I was going through the application. It was a Sally Mae loan. Click, 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 click. So easy. Um, and then I looked and it was $50,000 for one year of college at a 13% interest rate. And I thought, 
I, I, can't, I can't do this. You're never going to be able to pay this back. And this is for just one year of school. And I thought there was really something wrong with the system that even if they can do this, would trap someone who just didn't doesn't know better and didn't have the financial sophistication to understand there were other options out there. And it it made me worried that the, the deeper problem, and I'd love to get your view on this as, a, as the last question, the deeper problem underlying both the, the student loan issue and the mortgage crisis, it's a societal one as well as a, as a financial one in the sense that yes, both have cost taxpayers a great deal of money, but they've also caused fissures in our society because people have been told that this was what you should do and this was how you should get ahead and what good people did. And in both cases, the system turned out to be one that exploited them more than it did more than it did offer opportunities and that that may be that may be an overstatement but but I'd love to hear hear you think about that and if you worry about how that how that affects our country societally over time when people are told that things that are good for them turn out actually not to be yeah I don't think that's an overstatement um, the journal did a poll a few years back saying do you think college is worth it um, and I think something like half of people said, no, and half of people said yes. It was wow. like split down the middle, which was a very dramatic turnaround from just four years earlier when overwhelming majority of people said college is worth it. Um, I talked with the borrower, and so I, I agree with you. I think that it's really this student loan system for a lot of people, it's, it's helped erode their trust in these big institutions, um, whether it's Congress, whether it's colleges, whether it's banks. Um, you know, I talked with the most powerful moment in my reporting of this book was um, I was interviewing the main character, a woman named, who I call Lisa, that's a pseudonym. Yeah. And she was a single mom. Um, she was in her late twenties in, in uh, the 1990s when she decided she wanted to become a psychologist. She had been a secretary and she did, you know, what, which, what everyone said you needed to do to succeed, which was to go to college. And then she learned she had to go to grad school um, because state licensing requirements require psychologists in her state to have a PhD. So she ended up with $120,000 in debt, 25,000 of that was interest alone while that accrued while she was in school. And she could never get ahead of it. She ended up being a, um, you know, a single mom with two children and sending in checks and checks to Sally May um, and, and the education department every month, could never get ahead of it. Um, and just a lot of different things went wrong in her life and she kept on paying her loans. I showed that she's paid back her original balance and still owed $100,000. It was a 30 year term. And so she declares bankruptcy a week later after she declares bankruptcy, after she had paid back the original balance and then some, um, she gets diagnosed with cancer and her lawyer said, uh, and, she, and, the, and the education department through the state agency wouldn't back off and said, you still have to pay your loans. The bankruptcy code does not permit you to get out of these loans. And she, I was interviewing her in her office and she was, you know, just really just this kind, sweet woman who you can just tell she was just trying to do everything right in life. Um, and she said that at one point her lawyer came to her and said, there's a very, very narrow way for you to get out of your loans. Um, but you're going to have to convince the judge that you are beyond all hope. And she sat there and cried and said, I have spent my whole career counseling people against suicide and the government is putting me in a position where I have to be a suicidal to get, to get out of my student loans. And that was like the most powerful moment for me of reporting this book. And she said, like, they're treating me like I'm a criminal and I've tried to do everything I can to repay these loans. And, you know, and, and that's, that's where I think you're right. Like a lot of people have really lost trust in these big institutions and have felt like they've tried to do the right thing and um, yeah, and that they feel like they've been duped. <clears throat> yeah, her story was heartbreaking and I was very happy reading your book to discover that it actually did have a somewhat happy ending. It does have, a, it does have somewhat and, of a happy ending. And just tell us that in, the, in the, um, the randomness of life. Yeah, so, you know, after two years of, of trying to get out of these loans, um, at one point, she, after she drops her daughter off to college herself, um, she gets a call from her lawyer and says the, this state agency that was representing the education department essentially is, um, is not going to contest our motion to basically, I forget what the technical term is, but, you know, to, to have the judge reject the case. And um, they didn't know why, but they said, and, and there was no explanation. I called the state agency and they didn't have an explanation. 
but they said that the lawyer representing this agency had someone in his family die of cancer and he had expressed a lot of sympathy for her like at, at some point during the whole process the legal process and so they think maybe he got some sympathy in him and just decide, told the agency let's not pursue this um that's their best guess but so after this like horrific 20 years of paying off loans and not knowing, you know, where this was headed and this like, you know, two years of living with cancer and, and trying to get out of these loans, she finally was able to get out of them. And she doesn't have any retirement money, you know, she, or maybe like very little um, in part because she devoted so much money to her student loans, but like, she's just so happy that she doesn't have that hanging over her head and her cancer is in remission. So <clears throat> At least there's a sort of happy ending to an individual story, at least if not to the broader story. So as a journalist, I was fascinated by the fact that you ultimately got to Al Lord, and then who is this, this character who hangs over this whole story, really, because he was this incredibly charismatic and combative um, CEO of Sally Mae, and probably the most responsible among all the CEOs for both its its stock price success, but and its its more predatory practices. How did you come to think of him? particularly when he complained to you about the high cost of tuition at Penn State, where his grandchildren now go. Yeah, um, I came to think of him as very emblematic of the system at large, because you have so many different components. And, you know, I think your job, your book does a really good job of showing how this worked in housing. There were just so many different components to this huge system whether it's the government sponsored enterprises or the mortgage lenders or, you know, Congress or, you know, what have you, student loans is the same, but each component is just simply playing to their own financial interests. You know, schools are worried about their own finances. Albert Lord was very much motivated by, by making money. Um, I, I came to that conclusion because, you know, I asked everyone that I could who worked with him, like, what was his motive? Why did he engineer this, you know, really dramatic takeover of Sally May in the nineties? Like what was, his burning, you know, what was burning it within him. And they all said he wanted to get rich. And I, I asked him that I said, you know, look, these are what these people are saying. Is that true? And eventually he said, yes, you know, and you know, we, we all like money. So I, I'm not, you know, saying, you know, wanting to earn a living or a good living is, is a bad thing, but you just come to realize that uh, everyone has their own financial interests at play. And I think too often, students are not considered in, in the equation. And I, I asked him this because he is a huge credit of colleges. He, he served on the board of Penn State. He, he would like, according to him, what he told me, he would like raise, you know, a lot of complaints in the board meetings whenever he saw how much money they were spending. Um, because it was the opposite of how he ran Sally May. He like kept like such a tight whip on uh, spending at Sally May. He actually told, you know, his, his chief officers at Sally May, you've got to find a way to cut the budget every year so that we can become more efficient and boost our stock price. And he said when he saw how Penn State conducted itself, and by the way, Penn State disputes this, I want to be fair to them. Um, but, you know, from his perspective, like, you know, Penn State just is is part of this, you know, this broader issue in, among colleges of they don't pay attention to spending, they just spend too, too, too much. Um, but I asked him, you know, well, why didn't you say something about this earlier? You know, if, if you feel so strongly about it. And he, he said, you know, look, I, I knew for years that tuition was getting out of control. Of course I knew that. Um, but that wasn't my role. You know, my role isn't to raise these broader existential issues about society or the higher education program. My role was to boost my company's stock price. And I did a good job at that. <clears throat> Very Friedman-esque, right? Yeah. <laughs> he just said something mm -hmm. that is a great note to wrap up on, which is that students aren't considered. And it does seem through reading your book that students' well-being is put last behind people's opportunities to make money, behind the government's opportunities to um, obscure the accounting for its own benefit. Very few people think or are willing to talk about very few people in charge think or are willing to talk about what's the real benefit from for a student of this education how can we do this in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in the most effective manner possible? And how can we make sure that this actually benefits the student at the end of the day, rather than the government and, and private industry? 
Um, so I wanted to thank you so much for coming. Um, everybody here should read Josh's new book, The Debt Trap. It's really instructive and important. Um, I'd like to thank the audience for watching and participating. If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash online. Thank you so much for joining us and please enjoy the rest of the summer. And Josh, it was Thanks, lovely. I appreciate it. Be well, bye. Thank you.